Hello, everybody, and welcome to this arithmetic edition of our GMAT Ninja Quant video series. It's so great to have you all with us, and I'm excited to get started. Now, if you're like me, uh, when you heard this or you saw the title of this video, you probably thought to yourself, well, what do I need to learn arithmetic for? I learned arithmetic when I was in early grade school. I really don't feel like I, I need that. I feel like I've got all that down. I know how to add. I know how to subtract. That all feels very superfluous to me. So, however, there are a lot of things uh, as it relates to arithmetic that are very foundational uh, on the GMAT and that are, that are going to be very important. So I want to talk about whether this video is for you. Um, and, and, and I'll give you just, just kind of a quick rundown of whether this video is for you. So a few reasons that it could be for you. The first is this, is this video is for you if you lack efficiency or flexibility. One of the things that we see with many of the students that come to us is this, is that they come to us and they know how to solve just about every problem. Uh, but what happens is on test day, then all of a sudden they fall apart as they're going through the test or, or their, their results on test day don't actually line up with the results in their practice. They have a high rate of accuracy in, your, in their practice, but not on test day. And oftentimes that's because these students they know the foundational the, the foundational skills, but they lack the efficiency and flexibility to adapt and to solve problems in unique ways. And so what happens is when test day comes, there's the time pressure and all of a sudden they have to solve very efficiently. Um, they, they're, they're unable to do so and they, they ultimately underperform as a result. The second reason that this video may be for you is this, is that uh, you may miss a lot of easy questions. What we find is this, is that because the GMAT's an adaptive test, uh, it, it actually is a big deal when you miss easy questions. Many students come to us and, you know, teach me all the hard questions, show me all the hard questions. I want to see all the hard questions. And when, when you come in with that perspective, what happens is this, is you, oh, I missed that question, but that was easy. I know how to do it. So it's really not a big deal. And what happens is this, is that on test day, those easy questions that you're missing become a big deal because of the way that the, the GMAT is and the, the way that the scoring algorithm works is that when you miss easy questions, the, the test all of a sudden thinks that you have weak logical skills and you're not able to sort through even those easy questions. So all of a sudden what happens is this, is that your quant score starts to drop because you're missing easy questions that really you should be getting right. So if you're missing easy questions, this video could be for you. Third, if you need to learn or review the basics, we'll cover all of the, or many of the basics in this video, not necessarily all of them, but but we will go through them again. And, and fourth is this, is if you know everything but still struggle. I can't tell you how many students we see that have been studying for a year, two years, and they come to us and they say, I know everything, I know all the formulas, uh, know, know all the geometry rules, know everything about probability combinatorics, but for some reason on test day, it just doesn't translate and I still struggle. I'm still not able to perform to what I believe is my potential. So if you fall into any of those four buckets, then this, this video will be very um, helpful for you. The second thing I want to talk about is this, is what we're going to cover in this video. In this video, what we're going to cover uh, first and foremost is this is fraction de decimals and estimation. Uh, we'll talk through uh, how to work with fractions, difficult fractions, um, how, decimals, and, and as well as estimation, and how at times estimation can end up being the best way to solve a question. Second, we'll talk about roots and rationalizing denominators because that's a topic that comes up fairly frequently on the GMAT and uh, is worth discussing. A third, we'll talk about how to deal with big numbers when you see them. Uh, what are the best ways to tackle those big numbers and not be necessarily intimidated by them, but will hopefully give you the skills or the tools that you need to deal with those big numbers. Fourth, and this is a big one right here, we'll talk about choosing the best way to solve the question. You know, I think a lot of students view it like this. If I get the question right, that was a success. And one of the things you'll hear me say several times throughout this video today is that simply getting the question right doesn't necessarily mean that the question was a success. You can get a question right, but if you're not solving it in the best way or in the most efficient way, then there's ultimately an, uh, an opportunity cost that you're going to face and it can end up impacting uh, negatively impacting your score. And the fifth thing is this is we'll talk about how to avoid those careless mistakes because 
as I said earlier, missing those easy questions that can be a big deal on the GMAT. And so we'll talk about the best tools that we have to avoid those careless mistakes. So with that in mind, I want to dive into the one practical tool that I have to help you avoid careless mistakes. And again, this isn't, as I, as I kind of lay this out here, I want you to know that this isn't a magic cure-all. I wish that we had one of those. I wish that um, I had a way to help you avoid careless mistakes, but this is something that you really got to make work for you, something that you really got to make work for yourself. So I want to go through four steps that we recommend to all of our students, not that we recommend to all of our students, that we require of all of our students, and that uh, we as tutors follow as well. Four steps that I, that I want you to follow on every quant question that you see. And I'm going to write them up here on the board, and then I'm going to talk them through with you. So the first step is this, is that I want you to read every question twice with no exceptions. The second step is I want you to plot your path forward. And I'm gonna put as a sub point under this second step that if that path forward sucks, then we're gonna want you to guess and move on. And again, I'll come back and I'll discuss each of these steps in more detail in just a moment. The third step, is that we're going to want you to check each step as you go. And finally, we're going to want you to read the question one more time. So let me talk you through these. First, we're gonna want you to read every question twice. The reason we want you to read every question twice is this, is that a lot of, a lot of students will come to us and say, well, what about the longer questions? I don't have time to read the longer questions twice. Well, on the longer question, you have all the more reason to read the longer questions twice because there was something probably earlier in the question that you end up forgetting by the time you get later in the question and you end up missing the question as a result. So read every question twice with no exceptions, short questions, long questions. Now, there are some questions, and we'll see some uh, like this in throughout our, our session today, but there are some questions that it feels like, well, how, what's the point of of reading this question twice. Like if it says, which of the following is least or which of the following is greatest? What's the point of, of reading the question twice? Well, on those questions, what you're doing is even if you're not gaining anything from reading the question twice, although I have seen students mistake those questions, even if you're not gaining, you don't feel like you're gaining anything, what you're doing is you're building a habit. And this is all about building good habits. Um, so that when you, when you sit down on test day, you read every question twice and you don't have to selectively, oh, maybe this one I should read twice, maybe this one I shouldn't read twice, right? Building good habits. Second thing we want you to do is this, is we want you to plot your path forward. There's kind of two elements to this. Uh, the first one is this, is it's just kind of a time management thing. If your path forward sucks, if there's not an easy way for, or, or not, not a feasible way for you to solve the question, then guess and move on. But the second piece to step two is this, and, and, and just a little caveat on what I just said. We, we generally say no more than three minutes on any question. You don't want to spend more than three minutes on any question. If you're going to hit the three minute mark, just go ahead and guess and move on. The second piece of step two, though, is this, is we want you thinking about logically speaking, what's the best way to solve this problem? Not necessarily, hey, I see a triangle and all of a sudden I just vomit out the Pythagorean theorem or uh, three, four, five, or 30, 60, 90, and I just start to vomit out all the, all the rules I know about a, about a triangle, right? We, we, what we want you to do is we want you consciously thinking about what's the best way to solve this question. Remember that the GMAT's a quantitative reasoning test, as boring as that may sound. It's a quantitative reasoning test. It's not a math test. And so you're going to want to activate, step two is a chance to activate your logical brain and think about, okay, what's the, this is where you get to, what's the best way for me to solve this question? The third step is this, we're gonna want you to check each step as you go. Um, you know, how easy is it for something like 12 minus 3x minus eight to be equal to 12 minus 3x minus eight, and all of a sudden I get the whole problem wrong because I did it. Uh, distribute a negative, right? So check each step as you go. And we say as you go, not at the end, because if you're checking each step as you go, then, hey, I made an error on step two of nine. I just redo step two. Rather than I check them at the end, I made an error on step two of nine. Now I have to redo step two and step three all the way through step nine, 
right? So it ends up saving you time, even though it feels like it's taking more time in the moment, it ends up saving you time over the long run. And finally, it's this, read the question one more time. See if, go back, read the question one more time, make sure you're answering the right question. You did all that hard work to get to the answer choice. So go ahead, take some time, read the question one more time. You'll, you'll notice this, that um, how often do you see a question where it's like, they give you two sides of a triangle, they ask you for the perimeter, you solve for the third side, and the third side, it feels like, is always one of the answer choices. If you're like me, you always choose that third side as the answer choice. And so step four is my personal favorite step because it's bailed me out so many times. But go back, read the question one more time. With that in mind, with those four steps in mind, I want to dive into some questions. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put the first question up on the screen. And then I'm going to give you some time to solve it. And then once you've had some time to solve it, we'll come back and we'll talk through it together. So go ahead, take a second and try and work through this question that I put up here on the screen. Okay, awesome. So hopefully you had a chance to work through that question. And what, what I would ask you is this, is before we dive into how to do this question, you know, I want to kind of, as we go through this video, redefine the way that you think about success on a question. And the first thing I would ask you is this, is when you did that question, did you read the question twice? Did you take some time to consciously plot your path forward 15, 30, 60 seconds? Did you check each step as you went? And did you read the question one more time at the end? Because again, this, this, this whole thing is about building good habits. And even on an easy question like this one, you have an opportunity to build good habits. And so I, I want you to be thinking about, you know, when I, I don't just consider a question a success if I happen to get it right. I consider a question a success if I'm able to apply good technique, right? And we want to kind of reform, reshape your thinking in that way. If I did everything I could and I applied good technique and I still got the question wrong, well, that's okay. I, I, I started to build a good habit and now I have the opportunity to learn something. I have the opportunity to learn some new content. And content's easy to learn. Habits are hard to build, right? We're trying to take 20 plus years of, of bad habits. And for some of you in a matter of weeks, others in a matter of months and others over a year or two, we're trying to change those out and build good habits. So the question says this, one third of all adults sleep with a teddy bear. Now, interesting fact for you, that's actually kind of true. They did a study, one third of all adults sleep with some sort of uh, comfort object, like a blanket or a teddy bear. But anyway, um, one third of all adults sleep with a teddy bear, a teddy bear in order for 50% of all adults to sleep with a comfort object. So when you start to think about that, I think the most helpful way to kind of frame this question is to picture it on a number line. So right, you have up here, you have 100% or one out of one, all adults, right? This line, this line encompasses all adults, okay? And what we're told from the question is that one third of all adults sleep with a teddy bear and we want to know what we have to do to get to one half, 
of all adults. Now, what, what we see, because we often give students a similar version of this question, is that students often are very quick to jump to be here and say, okay, this is two sixths plus one sixth, that's going to get me to one half. But this is a great question, and really the point of this question is making sure that you're doing those four steps, because it doesn't say what fraction of all adults would have to sleep with a teddy bear. Uh, it says what fraction of other adults. So what fraction of the adults that don't currently sleep with a teddy bear would have to sleep with a teddy bear? So instead, rather than jumping straight to one six, what I'm going to think about is this. Well, really what I need is I need an extra one six, but not an extra one six of the total, an extra one six of the two thirds of adults that are encompassed right here in this range, the other adults that don't sleep with a teddy bear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it up just like this. I'm going to say, okay, one sixth is what I need of the two thirds of adults that don't sleep with a teddy bear currently. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up flipping and multiplying, right? Divide by a fraction, you flip and multiply. So I'm going to multiply by three over two. I'm going to cancel. We get two on the bottom here, one on the top there, and I'm going to end up at one fourth. And so the right answer here is going to be C. But again, the point of this question is this, make sure you're reading every question twice, right? Very easy on a question like this to miss the precise language, the precise wording of the question and ultimately miss an easy question because of that. With that in mind, I want to go ahead and take a look at, an, at another question here. I will uh, toss this one up on the screen in just a moment. Go ahead, take a second and work through this one. Okay, so remember this question's all about, or this session is all about building good process, building good habits. Hopefully you've had some time to read through this one, and hopefully you've had the opportunity to, as you were reading through it, you, you had uh, the opportunity to read it twice and, and come to a solution. But I want to talk about this one here and, and kind of dive into it, because there, there are some important elements uh, as it relates to rationalizing denominators here that ultimately become important. But first, if this looks completely unfamiliar to you and you have no idea what to do here, then you're going to probably want to hop over to one of Harry's wonderful geometry videos also on YouTube. And you're going to want to check one of those out uh, because he, he covers this in more detail. The, the point of this really isn't about it, it, at least for our sake, is really not about geometry here. So what I want to do is this, is in triangle ABC, we know that AC has a length of root 6. So I can say that AC right here has a length of root 6. And we want to know which of the following represents the perimeter of the triangle. So 
with that in mind, first thing hopefully that you notice is that I've got X, 2X, and 3X as my three angles within the triangle. Now, if you have a chance to check out Harry's geometry videos, or uh, if you just happen to know this, you know that the, the angles within the triangle add up to 180. So we're going to say that X plus 2X plus 3X is equal to 180, which means 6X equals 180, which means X is equal to 30, and all of a sudden 30, 60, 90, and we have ourselves a 30, 60, 90 triangle, which is great. Now, hopefully you remember that the 30, 60, 90 triangle, the side lengths have a certain ratio. Uh, so in the ratio of the side lengths of that triangle, it's going to be X, X root 3, and 2X. Now, you should note that the shortest side is going to be opposite the smallest angle. So this side here is going to be X. This side here is going to be equal to X root 3. And this side here is going to be the hypotenuse is going to be 2X, opposite the 90 degree angle, right? 30, 60, 90. So with that in mind, we know that X root 3 is equal to root 6. And then we come to the place where X is equal to root 6 over root 3. Now, when you see this, you may be a little bit confused because it looks like we're dividing roots and you may feel a little bit uneasy about dividing roots. Uh, but basically, the idea here is that what we'll be able to do, and, and there are multiple ways to do this, but one of the things that we can do is that we can rationalize this denominator, right? We don't like to have a root in the denominator. I see that in my answer choices, none of the, uh, none of the answer choices have a root in the denominator, which they most likely never will on the GMAT. Uh, but so I, I have no root in the denominator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rationalize this denominator. Why is it bad to have a root in the denominator? I guess it's just bad math etiquette or something like that. But, uh, but we don't want a root in the denominator. So what I'm going to do is this, is to get that root out of the denominator, I'm going to multiply by radical 3 on the bottom. Because if I do radical 3 times radical 3, then that's going to get me to 3 on the bottom. Now, on the top, what I'm going to do is this, is I'm also going to multiply by radical 3 here on the top. So I'm going to multiply by root 3 over root 3. And when I multiply by root 3 over root 3, I'm going to get that x is equal to the square root of 18 over 3. Now, when I continue to simplify that, what I'll see is this, is that I can say that the square root of 18 is equal to the square root of 9 times the square root of 2 over 3. The square root of 9 is 3. 3 divided by 3 is going to, those two are going to cancel. And so I'm going to get that x is equal to root 2. So with that in mind, x is equal to root 2. Again, I'm looking for the perimeter. And so when I think about the perimeter, I'm going to add up all the sides. So what I know is this, is that my side length that's length x, that's going to be uh, root 2. So I'm going to have root 2 for x. For uh, x radical 3, I'm going to have root 2 times root 3. Root 2 times root 3 is going to be root 6 plus root 6. And then 2 times x is going to be 2 root 2. So hold on, let me just erase this here, give us a little bit more space. But I'm going to get plus 2 root 2. I'm going to add like terms, 3 root 2 plus root 6. And it just so happens that that is D. So if you chose D here, then you were correct. But that's the basics of rationalizing the, uh, the denominator. Just kind of bad math etiquette. You don't, for some reason, there is math etiquette. But it's bad math etiquette. And you want to get rid of the roots in the denominator. And so that's what we're doing here. You multiply uh, by that same root. That way you get um, the number three in the denominator. All right. With that in mind, I want to go on to an example that's a little bit more complex, but the same basic principles 
are going to apply here. So let me go ahead and I'm going to toss this one up on the screen for you here. Take a second and look through this. Okay, so hopefully you had a moment to work through that question. If you're still working through it, go ahead and just pause the video at this point before I jump into a solution. But this question is one that uh, I really like this question because it looks very intimidating. It has a very intimidating look and feel. And oftentimes the first thing that sets in when you see a question like this is just kind of panic, right? That's kind of the first thing that sets in. And it, you just, what, what, what can I do, right? And so one of the things that we often talk about with our students is, what, you know, how do you react when that panic, that initial panic just sets in? And, and I don't know how to solve this. I don't know immediately how to solve this question. But one of the things we often tell our students to kind of ask themselves is this, is, is what can I do? And just start to work with what you can do and then trust that on the GMAT things in general just kind of have a tendency to work themselves out. So yes, the prompt here looks nothing like the answer choices, but we know that things on the GMAT kind of have a tendency to work themselves out. And so let me just push things, let me just move things along and I'm just going to kind of trust that as I do that, that things are going to kind of work themselves out. So Here's here's kind of the way that I'm going to start uh, to approach this one here is uh, when I first look at this question and hold on, let me go ahead and bring myself full screen. So when I first look at this question, uh, there are a couple things that stick out to me. Number one, I kind of see the answer choices and I and I see the way that they are. And I, so I know I'm going to have to simplify things a good deal to get to an answer choice. But. The, but the other thing I notice is this, is I've got uh, a square root of a square root here, and that feels like that's not going to work out in the long run, right? And then I also see that I have, again, a uh, root in the denominator, and I know that uh, that's not looked upon favorably. So with that in mind, I'm going to start to kind of simplify things, and I'm, I'm going to kind of simplify it in pieces uh, because that's the way that... Uh, it just makes the most sense to me. So what I'm going to start with is this square root of 147, right? And I don't know that uh, the 147 is a perfect – in fact, I know that 147 isn't a perfect square because I know 144 is 12 squared. I know that 169 is 13 squared. So I'm sure that 147 isn't a perfect square. But I am curious whether I can break it at, down and whether there's anything that I can take out of the square root of 147. And so when I look at 147, one of the things, obviously it's not going to be divisible by any even because it's not an even number, but one of the things I notice when I add up the digit, 7 plus 4 plus 1 is going to give me 12 because 12 is divisible by 3. The sum of the digits is divisible by 3. Then 147 is going to be divisible by 3. Now, I happen to know that 3 times 50 is going to give me 150. So 3 times 49 
is going to give me 147. And so what I'm going to be looking for then is the square root of 3 times 49 or the square root of 147. Now, the square root of 3 times 49 is nice because I can break that up. That's the square root of 3 times the square root of 49, which is going to give me 7 root 3. Now, you may go about that in a slightly different manner, right? You may not think, okay, 3 times 50 is 150. You may use long division, right? There, there are different ways to, to get there. It's kind of a matter of personal preference. But basically, the point that I want everybody to get to is, okay, the square root of 3 times the square root of 49. From there, I'm able to take the square root, and I'm able to get that, okay, the square root of 147 is going to be 7 root 3. Then what I'm going to do is this, is I know that I also want to deal with this monstrosity right here. The 4 doesn't really bother me. This is a mess. That's a disaster. So let me start to deal with it. I've got 42 over 3 plus root 3. Now you remember that on the last question, when we had root 3 in the denominator, all I did was I multiplied by root 3 to get rid of it. That's not going to work here. Because if I multiply by root 3, sure, I'm going to get a 3 here, but then I'm going to get a 3 root 3 here, and it's like I really haven't solved any problems. So what I'm going to do is this, and this actually, the idea behind this actually comes from the fact that uh, x squared minus y squared is equal to x plus y times x minus y. But I'm going to think of this, again, the goal is to get rid of this root. I'm going to think of this as x plus y, and I'm going to multiply by x minus y. So I'm going to multiply by 3 minus root 3. And obviously, if I'm going to multiply by that on the bottom so that I can get rid of my root on the bottom, I'm also going to want to multiply by that same thing on the top, okay, because I don't want to change the underlying value. Same as multiplying by 1, right? So I'm going to multiply by 3 minus root 3 on the top, okay? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the whole thing should have been in parentheses, not just that little part. But anyway, so I'm going to multiply by 3 minus root 3 on the top. And what I'm going to get here is this, is that when I, when I start to simplify it, remember, x plus y times x minus y is going to give me x squared minus y squared. So on the bottom, I'm going to get 3 squared minus root 3 squared, which is going to be 3. On the top, I'm going to get 42 times 3 minus 42 times root 3. Now, one of the mistakes that we see students make very often is this, is that they're going to go right away, I'm going to multiply 42 by 3, and then I'm going to get some big number, and then later on I'm going to end up reducing it anyway. So I'm not actually going to multiply out that 42 times 3 because I have a feeling I've still got stuff in the denominator, maybe something could cancel, right? And so what, what I end up with is this, is that this ends up being 42 times 3, and then on the, in the denominator I'm going to have a 6 which happens to be wonderful, makes me very happy. And here's why. Because the 6 is going to cancel with my 42. I'm going to end up with 7 there. And I'm going to cancel with this 42, and I'm going to end up with a 7 there as well. So what I'm going to get is 21 minus 7 root 3. Okay. And this pleases me a lot. And here's why it pleases me a lot. Because I know that I got a 7 root 3 out of my root 147. So I'm going to rewrite this all in a manner that is going to kind of show, show all the work that I've done. I'm going to bring it all together at this point. right? So I can rewrite this thing as, remember, I took this term and I simplified it here. So I'm going to have 21 minus 7 root 3. Then I'm going to do plus 4 because I didn't change my 4 term right there. And then remember that when I simplified this root 147, it came to 7 root 3. So I'm going to go plus 7 root 3. And this is just beautiful, beautiful math. It all works out on the GMAT. And 
the seven root threes cancel, minus seven root three plus th seven root three, 21 plus four is 25. I get that it's equal to the square root of 25. The square root of 25 is five. And so I'm going to, I'm sorry, C, I'm going to choose five. So if you chose C, C was correct, but, uh, but th this is kind of the best way to go through this process and, and work through this process. And hopefully, you know, the big takeaway here is this, is that sometimes on the GMAT, first of all, there's the rationalizing denominator, just technique takeaway. But, but, but a good process takeaway is this, is that sometimes on the GMAT, you're going to have, find yourself in a place where I don't really know exactly what to do. And the best, my, my best option or my best path forward is just to start to simplify things, start with mess, to mess with things, right? And, and I just, okay, what can I do? Because I don't always see the path all the way to the solution. With that in mind, I want to take a look at another one. We're going to shift gears here and go to the uh, fourth question. And I'm going to go ahead and put this one up on the screen. Go ahead, take a second, work through this, uh, and in a moment we'll come back and we'll talk through it together. Wonderful. Hopefully you've had some time to work through the question. If not, you can go ahead and pause it before we dive into it together. So one of the things that probably jumps out to you again with this question, and a lot of these questions that we're going through, is that it's kind of an intimidating question, right? My first instinct when I see this question is negative 4.2 squared. Really, I'm going to have to think through 42 squared, uh, and I do not look forward to doing that. Right. So negative 4.2 squared, that doesn't sound fun to think through, um, nor do a lot of these other fractions. Right. Squaring decimals just in general isn't a whole lot of fun. But there are some strategies that you can use as you're as you're kind of working through this. And, and one of the ones that's most helpful on a question like this is that I kind of noticed that there's a there's a fairly big difference between some of these uh, some of these answer choices you know almost uh, in, in, in terms of a power of 10 between a lot of them and, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out uh, and I'm going to see if I can apply some tools of estimation here to make my life a lot easier right so and we'll talk through there, there are some things to keep in mind when you're estimating but we'll kind of talk through those as we go through this together so when I see negative 4.2 squared, I have a couple options. Number one, I could do negative 4.2 times negative 4.2. I don't like that option because that feels like a lot of work and I don't know what 42 squared is, so that's not gonna help. I also could think of it in terms of a fraction. I could you know, think of it that two tenths is one fifth. I've seen students before break this up and do like negative five plus 0.8 square, th things like that, right? There, there's all sorts of options. I could even use fractions, 
you know, make this make this whole thing a fraction and say that it's 21 fifths. Um, yeah, I think 21 fifths would be. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, so so there are there are plenty of options that I have there. But but the, but I think the best one is this, is that I can say that I know four squared uh, is going to give me 16. And so 4.2 squared, I mean, it's not going to give me 16 exactly, but it's going to give me 16 ish. Right. 16, a little more than 16. Right. Uh, so I know that negative 4.2 squared is going to give me about 16. I also know that then I'm going to subtract by, uh, by six times 1.2 squared. Now, this one, my life gets a little bit easier here because I do know that 12 squared is 144. And so 1.2 squared, I'm in a no right away. That's 1.44, right? But rather than doing 1.44 times 6, which again is just going to make my life very difficult, I'm going to say about 1.5 times 6, right? Ends up being about 1.5 times 6. So I'm going to say, okay, I have 16 minus 9-ish is what I'm going to end up with here. And when, when I do that, then, then what I know is this, is that I know that I have here, my, my 16, that's an underestimation, right? So this is 16 is actually less than what this number will be. I also know that nine, that's an overestimation, right? Because I did 1.5 times six instead of 1.4 times six. So I know that that nine is probably an overestimation. So I underestimated my positive number. I overestimated my negative number. And so what happens is just in the back of my mind, if you're able to kind of track with this, I know that the number that I'm going to get in the numerator of my fraction is going to be smaller than what it really should be. Because again, 16 is smaller than what I started with. And nine is really more than I should actually be subtracting from. So I know that when I do 16 minus 9, that again, I'm going to get a number that's smaller than what it actually is in the denominator. And it's good if when you're estimating, you can kind of keep in mind whether you're overestimating or underestimating or, you know, whether you're going kind of both ways. You want to, you want to be able to keep that in mind, right? So I end up with 16 minus 9, which is about 7-ish on the top. And again, remember, I know that my numerator that 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 is over i'm sorry that, that that's underestimated on the bottom i'm still going to have three and so i'm going to get seven over three which is two and one third now i come to the answer choices and pretty clearly i'm going to go towards e right because the answer choices uh obviously here you know c through a through c are out you get down to D or E, well, two and one third is definitely a lot closer to three than it is to 0 0.3. But the other thing is this, is remember, I underestimated in my numerator. So if I underestimated in my numerator, and this is just something to keep in mind if you ever find yourself, you know, had you found yourself where D was something like, uh, let's say it was something like one, or it started to get you worried, am I, am I, did I, if I know that I underestimated here, in my numerator, then I know that this number is smaller than it actually should be. And so I know that my answer choice is actually going to be bigger because this number is smaller than what it actually should be. So with that, I can comfortably say that E is going to be the right answer choice here. So estimation there, simple example, but estimation is oftentimes a tool that's going to save you a lot of time on the GMAT. And it's going to uh, allow you to solve problems much, much quicker. I will say this, a lot of students feel very uncomfortable estimating. And the reason for that is this, is because it's like, how do I know when I'm estimating too much? Or how to, right? One of the things that you're gonna to wanna to do is, is you're going to want to practice how you play. So if you plan on estimating on the actual test, which you should, at times you're going to want to estimate on the actual test. You should do that in your practice. Don't say, oh, well, I have the time on this question to multiply 4.2 by 4.2. No. You want to estimate in your practice just like you would on the actual test. So with that in mind, I want to take a look at another one here and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into this one as well. Let me go ahead and toss this one up on the screen.
Awesome. Let's take a moment to talk through this one here. So the question says this, if A is the hundredth digit in the decimal 0.7A and B is the thousandth digit in the decimal 0.08B, where A and B are non-zero digits, which of the following is closest to the least possible value of 0.7A and 0.08B? Now, hopefully on this question, you applied those four steps that we talked about at the very beginning. Hopefully you read the question twice, you read it one more time at the end, because there are little details in this question that can end up tripping you up if you don't pay close attention to the way in which uh, the question is written. So with that in mind, let's, let's take a look at this one on the board. I know that I want to find the least possible value of 0.7a over 0.08b. Well, to find the least possible value, I'm going to want to minimize the numerator and I'm going to want to maximize the denominator, obviously assuming that they're positive numbers, which they are because there's a negative sign on the, on the front of it. But so I'm going to want to minimize the numerator, I'm going to want to maximize the denominator. Now, one of the temptations on this question is this, is that I can go straight to 0 0.70. Uh, I can go straight to 0 0.70a and make on the bottom point, you know, 8, 9, B. But you've got to remember that it says A and B are non-zero digits. So, again, to minimize what I have in the numerator, I'm going to make it 0.71. To maximize what I have in the denominator, I'm going to make it 0.089. Uh, and when I do that, now all of a sudden I can, I can start to solve. And I have a lot of different options here for how I can solve. And sure, there are some inefficient ways to solve, right, which would be actually doing the division here. But there are also plenty of efficient ways to solve. Okay, one way that I could solve this is I could say, okay, this is about, I could multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 100. And I could say, okay, this is about 71 over 8.9. I could multiply the numerator and denominator by 1,000 and say that this is about 710 over 89. I could even probably write this in scientific notation and say that it's, you know, 7. 0.1 times 10 to the negative first over 8.9 times 10 to the negative second, right? I could I could even do that. However, I think that probably, you know, if, if it were me, I'd do probably one of these two, and I'd probably do the first one here personally. Again, it's just a matter of personal preference. When I think about this then, so I have 71 over 8.9. Again, I could do the actual math, but that's not really an efficient way to solve it. If I want to solve this efficiently, well, 71... And it's about 72, 8.9, that's about 9. 72 over 9 is about 8. And again, helpful for me to know whether um, just when I look at the answer choices, um, I, I, I want to realize that 8.9 times 9 is going to get me pretty close to 7. I'm sorry, times, I'm sorry. 8.9 times 8 is going to get me pretty close to 71. I want to recognize that right off the bat. Some people may have some doubt between 9 and, and, and 8. But again, if you, if you think about it, if you're going to multiply uh, almost 9 by 9, then you're going to get much closer to 81 than you are going to get to 70, uh, 72 or 71, which is where you want to be. So. Again, another question where estimation, super helpful, okay, breaking down the question, what's it asking of me, minimize the numerator, maximize the denominator, okay, if I can do that, then I can set it up, multiply each, multiply top and bottom by 100, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, work through it with some estimation there. Let's go ahead um, and let's take a look at another one here.
Okay, so hopefully you've had a second to work through this one here, and hopefully uh, that's all gone okay for you. Now, this one's pretty tricky, and, and we'll talk through kind of the best way to approach it. It can actually be pretty challenging. But uh, I want to go ahead and, and, and dive into the way. And actually, the last step here to convert is, is really uh, tricky as well. But let's take a second, and, and we'll kind of talk through the best way to approach this because it has some some cool elements to it. So the first thing is this, is that I want the sum of the reciprocals of the five consecutive integers from one over 16 to, um, from 16 to 20, right? So the reciprocals I'm going to get at one over 16 plus one over 17 plus one over 18 plus one over 19 plus one over 20, okay? and now, here's what you want to notice is that from 1 over 16 to 1 over 20, these numbers, the fractions all decrease, right? 1 over 17 is less than 1 over 16, right? So I'm going to end up I, – I, one of the ways that a lot of people want to jump into this is they want to find some sort of common denominator. But that's going to be, practically speaking, pretty impossible uh, during the time constraints that you're given by the GMAT. But – so, so really my only path forward here is to estimate. So when I think about estimating, well, I'm going to try and find some sort of range that this number is going to fall into. And here's what I know, is that if I had five one sixteenths, then I would end up at five over 16, right? And that would be the maximum possible value. But, but again, I know it's less than that because one over 17 is less than... 1 16th, right? So, so I know that I'm going to end up less than 5 over 16. So if I call this sum x, and let's say I said that x is equal to this, right? I could say that it's less, x is less than 5 over 16. Okay. What I also know is that if I had 5 1 20ths, I'd end up at 5 20ths. 5 20ths is going to give me 1 4th. Right, but I don't have five one twentieths. I have one one twentieth, and I have four other numbers that are a little bit bigger than one twentieth. So I know that x is going to be greater than five over twenty, which is going to be one fourth. So I know x falls somewhere in the range of one fourth to five sixteenths. Now, for the sake of this question, I'm going to approximate. I'm going to say that five sixteenths is is about one third. Okay, I know it's actually a little bit less than one third, right? But I'm going to say that x falls approximately in the range of, well, I'm sorry, one fourth to one third, right? So, but here's what I want you to notice. So that eliminates for me three of the answer choices, right? A's out, D's out, E's out. And now I'm just looking at B versus C, okay? Now, here's where I think this particular question gets really tricky, because the question is, is it closer to one third or is it closer to one fourth? And I'm going to give you one way to think about it. And, and again, this is I, I think that, you know, an average level of difficulty on on the answer choice, probably uh, I'm sorry, on the GMAT, probably, you know, you're given a range and you just choose between one third and one fourth. Right. But there's an extra layer of difficulty here because you have to figure out which one it's closer to. And I'll, I'll let you know how, how I would think about this. I would think about it like this. So if I draw for myself a number line between zero and one, okay? And what I notice is this. If I have one half, that's right there. I have one third, that's probably about right there. I have one fourth, that's probably about right there. I have one fifth, that's probably about right there. And do you notice how, as I keep going smaller and smaller, the numbers here keep getting closer together. Each, each one of these fractions keeps getting closer together, right? One sixth is gonna be even closer to one fifth than one fifth is to one fourth, right? One third is a lot closer to one fourth than it is to one half, okay? So with that in mind, then I'm going to draw myself another number line. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a number line between 
what I'm going to call uh, on the right side, 1 16th. And on the left side, I'm going to have 1 20th. And you remember how as I, as I increased the denominator, I got closer and closer to this left side. Well, remember, five of these is going to get me one fourth. Five of these is going to get me a little bit less than one third, right? What I'm going to notice is just like here, the numbers start to bunch up on the left. If I were to do the, the same, go through the same process and say, well, let's say 117 falls somewhere in here and 118 falls somewhere in here and 119 falls somewhere in here. And again, that spacing is not perfect there. But what you're going to notice is that the numbers start to group up on the left side of this rather than on the right side of this, which means that the sum of those numbers is going to be a lot closer to 120th then uh, I'm sorry, five one twentieths. Then it is going to be two five one sixteenths. And so for that reason, it's going to end up being C. The uh, the sum here is going to be closest to one fourth because again, it's going to be closer to five one twentieths, which is one fourth, than it is going to be to five one sixteenths, which is a again a little bit less than one third. But this is a tricky question. Uh, for sure. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at another one here. Awesome. So hopefully you had the opportunity to work through that. If not, you can go ahead and pause it right here before I dive into the explanation of this question. So it says that Bo, he profits $6 and six cents every time he sells a kebab and 79 cents every time he sells a pita. He runs a very tasty restaurant. I love kebabs. I love pita. If you've never had any pita from Jerusalem or kebab, uh, or shawarma, actually. I prefer shawarma in Jerusalem. It is absolutely phenomenal. I highly recommend that you go there and get this. Everybody deserves that before they pass on. And so anyway, uh, yesterday, Bo, he uh, only sold kebabs and pitas, and he sold a total of 214 kebabs and pitas. And what we want to know is, was Bo's profit more than seven hundred dollars yesterday so with that in mind um this question again is one that i think in in my personal opinion you have to you almost have to estimate here right it, if you don't estimate i think this question can get just ridiculously difficult so uh, first i'm going to look at statement one here which says this that bo he he sold more pitas than he sold uh kebabs yesterday 
And when I start to think about that, what that, what that really tells me is that uh, the number of pitas that he sold. Well, let me let me start with this. Actually, let me let me push the question first and say that Bo's profit uh, is going to be this. That the profit is going to be equal to. Um, it, it's going to be equal to six point oh six times the number of kebabs he sells plus 0.79 times the number of pitas he sells. And I'm going to do pitas with an I because I use profit at the P. So, uh, and then what I know is that K, the number of kebabs he sells, plus the number of pitas he sells is going to be equal to 214. And my goal here is to determine whether or not he would have to, uh, my goal here is to determine whether he sold, whether he's made a profit of more than $700 yesterday. So one thing that we want to encourage you to do here is kind of push the question and think about, well, what would really have to happen for Bo to profit more than $700 yesterday, right? Even before I jump into the statements, what's going to what's gonna be required for Bo to profit more than $700? Because in the back of my mind, I think, okay, so if Bo sells, you know, I've got 214, uh, just I want to process a little bit in my mind. I think if Bo, if Bo sells about 100 kebabs, let's say, he sells uh, 100 kebabs, then that's going to get him to – about six hundred dollars in profit, and um, if he sells about, let's say, one hundred and fourteen pitas, then again, and this is where I'm going to estimate, like just like I estimated the six hundred, and say six hundred and six, just estimated, say six hundred. Um, when I think about one hundred and fourteen times the profit per pita. Right, 114 times 0.79 is going to be kind of hard, but just round up to 0.8. And when I say, okay, 114 times 0.8, well, 100 times 0.8 is going to give me 80. And then I'm going to have about uh, 14 times 0.8, which 14 times 0.8 is going to give me about another 8 and then another 3. So let's say... Uh, about nine more, right? And you'll notice that if I sell 100 kebabs, I'm actually still going to fall short, okay? Which is going to be important. So then when I get to the statements and I look at the individual statements, it says Bo sold more pitas than kebabs yesterday. Okay. Well, if he sold more pitas than kebabs, then that means I'm going to think in my head, I want to know the minimum profit that Bo would have made yesterday. I don't want to look for the maximum profit because I know the maximum profit is going to be greater than 700. I want to know if it's going to be greater than 700. So I want to know the minimum profit. Okay. Well, the minimum profit that uh, Bo is going to have is if he sells just 108 kebabs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, he sold more pitas than kebabs. So that's going to be sorry about that. 108 pitas. And that would then be 106 kebabs. Now, just based on, again, just kind of some estimation, what that's going to get me to is I'm going to get to about $636 in profit from my uh, kebabs, because again, about $6 in profit per kebab times 106. Right, going to get me to about 636 in profit. I know that that's a slight underestimation. And then I know that from the kebabs, I'm going to have about 106, so about 80. Okay. And again, I know that I underestimated for both of those. Right. I know that 636 was an underestimate. I know that 80 was an underestimate. And because I know that both of those two are underestimates, and you'll notice that this clearly is going to put me over 700, then I don't even need to push things any further. I don't need to find out exact numbers, right? My estimation has shown me that statement one is not sufficient. So when I'm thinking, okay, AD over BCE, all right, AD is going to be out. A and D are going to be out as answer choices. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to tackle statement two. 
Statement two tells me that Bo sold fewer than 64 kebabs yesterday. Okay, so if he sold fewer than 64 kebabs yesterday, then that means that I'm going to have about 63 times 6.06. .06. And you remember, uh, hopefully you remember, hopefully you're able to think back to the math that we did when uh, when when we sold, we said 100 kebabs, that that fell short. And so if I stick with what, what I pushed the question, the, in the way I pushed the question, then I'm already going to know that statement two is going to be sufficient. But for the sake of sticking with statement two, okay, so I'm going to have about 60 three times 6.06. .06. Now I know 60 times six is going to be 360. So I, I know I'm going to get a number somewhere in the high 300s, right? So let's say I say about 380, okay? And then I know that from the, the uh, I can take from those 63, again, this is the maximum amount of kebabs. I want to maximize the kebabs to maximize his total profit, okay? Then I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take from that number 214, I'm going to subtract 63, which is going to give me 151, right? 151 times 0.8. And what I'm gonna notice, that's about 150 times 0.8, right? So 100 times 0.8 is 80, 50 times 0.8 is, is 40. So that's gonna be about 120. And it's very clear to me here that I'm going to fall well short even though I overestimated here, I overestimated here, it's clear to me that I'm going to fall well short between 380 and 120. I'm going to fall well short of 700. So I know for sure that, that uh, his profit was less than 700 based on statement two. And so I'm going to say that the answer is B. This question is a great example of you know, where there are multiple paths to the solution and some paths are more, more efficient, some paths are less efficient. I could have worked out all the math there and it would have taken me forever. And we see a lot of students who work out all the math, it takes them forever. And, you know, in my mind, that's not a success if it takes me forever. I want to find a way to do the problem efficiently. Um, and, and that's what I was able to do um, in the end there. And so, again, looking for the most efficient path to the solution, not just necessarily any path to the solution. Let's go ahead and take a look at another one right here in a group of 17 wealthy individuals. All right, go ahead and pause if you haven't had a chance to get to a solution. And let's go ahead and dive into this question. So it asks, in a group of 17 wealthy individuals, the poor seven have a net worth of 777 million each, while the rest have a net worth of 811 million each. What is the average net worth in millions for the entire group? So when I start to think about this, my instinct is this, is that this is essentially just kind of a weighted average, right? I want to do, in my mind, I, I think, okay, I want to do something like 777 times 7 plus 
uh, it's going to be 811 times 10 divided by 17. But I know that that's going to get very messy. Number one, because 777 times 7 is going to be ridiculously challenging to sort through. And number two, because uh, dividing by 17 is never super easy. And so, especially once you get beyond 100, uh, kind of hard to figure out whether a number is divisible by 17 or not. So I could do it that way. And I could arrive at the right answer choice, but ultimately that's not the most efficient way to do it. So hopefully you had some step two in your process there and you thought to yourself, okay, what is the best path forward? What's the most efficient way to solve this problem? What I'm going to do here is this, is that uh, when I take that step two and I start to think about what the most efficient way to solve this problem is, I, I noticed that it's really a challenging problem because the numbers are so big. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine for myself that 777, I'm going to make 777 my zero. And what that means is this, is I'm going to treat the number line as if, I'm going to shift the number line, and I'm going to treat the number line as if 777 is zero, and 776 is negative one, and 778 is positive one. And I'm going to treat 777 as if it's my zero. And what that means is this, is that in, in what's going to happen is at the end of this, at the end of determining the average, I'm going to add that 777 back in. So what I'm going to do is this, is I'm going to say, instead of 777 times seven, I'm going to say zero times seven. And then I'm going to add and instead of doing 811 times 10, and I can't do that because remember that as it relates to the wealth, I made 777 zero as it relates to the wealth. Not as it relates to every number of the world, but just as it relates to the wealth, right? So what I'm going to do is instead of 811, I'm going to notice that 811 is 34 more than 777. So I went 34 places to the right on the number line. So I'm going to say... 34 times 10. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to still divide the whole thing by 17. You'll notice that the math happens to work out a lot better when I do this. And what happens is this, is that this cancels. My 17 cancels with my 34. And my 34 becomes a 2. And all of a sudden, the average is equal to 20. Now, when the average is equal to 20, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to say, remember, I set 77, 777 equal to my zero. And so now my average is going to be 20 more than 777. So I'm going to add 20 to 777. That's going to get me to 797. And if you said C, you were correct. We've got one more question here to go through. So I'll put that up on the screen in a moment, give you a second to work through it, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it together.
Wonderful. Hopefully you've had time to sort through the question. If you haven't had time to sort through the question, you can go ahead and pause it here and we'll work through this one together. But here's what it says. It says that Jake, he bought a bowl of soup for X dollars. Adam bought a bowl of soup for Y dollars. If Jake paid an additional 8% sales tax and Adam paid an additional B% percent sales tax, did Jake pay more than Adam? So one of the things we often advocate is pushing the question. And one of the things that we I often see students do on this particular question is this, is they'll, they'll say, okay, so Jake paid X dollars plus times one plus A over a hundred and Adam paid Y times one plus B over a hundred. And I want to know which of these two is greater, right? And in theory, that is exactly what you want to know, right? I want to know which of these two is greater. And I have to kind of sort through the, the, the information that I'm given and see if I can get there. So a lot of times we'll see students do one of two things. Either try and sort through this whole mess and try and plug in these numbers in some sort of algebraic fashion, or they'll start guessing numbers. And those are the two instincts that they have. But I want you to think through this question with me logically and think about what it's really saying in terms of real world. So statement one tells me this. It tells me that A is greater than B. Well, if I know that A is greater than B, let me translate that real world. It's telling me that the percent tax that Jake paid is higher than the percent tax that Adam paid. Now, pretty quickly off the bat, you should say, okay, I know the percent tax was higher. I don't know whether how much the base amount was, so it really doesn't help me, right? Pretty quickly, I'm able to say, okay, statement one's not sufficient, right? All it tells me is which one had a higher tax percentage, right? Statement two says this, that AX is less than BY. Well, here's what I know, is that if I wanted to compare the tax that the two paid, AX over 100 would be the tax that Jake paid. BY over 100 would be the tax that Adam paid, right? That would give you the dollar amount of the tax that the two paid, right? So I know that these, the, these two look very similar to me to the numbers that, uh, to, to, to what would be the actual dollar amount paid in tax. In fact, all that you've done, really, I could say AX over 100 is less than BY over 100, right? Because I can divide both sides by 100 and that's fine, right? I'm not changing anything. Dividing both sides by the same thing, I can do that. Then what you'll notice is this, is that I can say that because I know that AX over 100 is less than BY over 100. That means that the amount of tax that Jake paid is less than the amount of tax that Adam paid. But again, we don't know how much they paid for their individual respective bowls of soup. And so for that reason, we don't know whether Jake or Adam paid more. We just know that Jake paid more tax in terms of a dollar amount. So statement two alone, that's out. Now I start to think about the statements together. And here's where things can get true. Sometimes students will try to plug in numbers. And you could do that. You could guess numbers, test cases, but that is going to be a lot of work. You could try and solve algebraically, but again, eh, it's going to get really messy really fast. So uh, what, what I would rather you do is this, as I would rather you think about it in this way. I know that the percent tax that Jake paid was higher, but I know that the actual amount of tax he ended up paying was lower. So there's two things for me to consider here. There's the cost of the soup, right? Uh, so I have the cost of the bowl of soup, and I have the cost of the tax. Well, I know from statement two that the tax that Adam paid, I'm sorry, the tax that Jake paid was less than Adam. Statement one tells me that the percent tax that Jake was paying was higher. Well, if he was paying a higher percent and he ended up spending a lower dollar amount 
on tax, then what that means is that his overall cost of his soup was lower. And the reason for that is this, is because I'm multiplying a higher number by, you know, if, if A is my higher number, then theoretically you would think that if X and Y were the same, then AX over 100 would be greater than BY because A is greater than B. But if, if for AX over 100 to be less than BY over 100, then what that means is that the dollar amount or the X that Jake paid must be less than the Y that Adam paid for his bowl of soup. And so what that tells me is that Jake paid less for a bowl of soup than did Adam. And if I know that Jake paid less than Adam for the bowl of soup, and I know that he paid less for the tax, then I know that he paid less overall. And so I'm able to sort through all the information. And what you can see is that I did very little math here. A lot of it was just logic, reasoning, sorting through the information. So hopefully that has been helpful for you. Hopefully this video as a whole has been helpful for you. Again, remember the main takeaways from this video. Those four steps I introduced to you at the beginning could very well be the most helpful piece of this video when you apply those practically. Remember to read each question twice, plot your path forward, you know, check each step as you go, read the question one more time at the end. Make sure that you're looking for the logical, the best way to solve each question, not the not the not the first way that comes to your mind make sure that you are taking note of those careless errors you're being very diligent to prevent those careless errors because they have a huge impact on your school hopefully this has been beneficial to you and i hope that you also find the videos in the days ahead also to be beneficial for you we just thank you so much for for being a part of this and, and watching this